earthquake has hit Los Angeles, and the city is in ruins. Or is it? Actually, this devastated city is the work of legendary map painter Albert Whitlock. It may surprise you to learn just how many famous movie scenes were created by the fine artists of the effects world. From ancient Rome, to the planet Bajor, to the Bat Cave, matte painting has for nearly a century been a widely used method of depicting exotic locations. Today, we'll go behind the scenes on the bizarre comedy Adam's Family Values and learn how some of the most elaborate scenes in the movies are literally works of art. Then, we'll meet two matte painting legends and see how this technique was used to enhance such popular films as Gone with the Wind. Meet the Michelangelos of cinema on Movie Magic. In this scene from Gone with the Wind, few moviegoers realize that the panorama above Scarlett O'Hara is painted artwork. Many famous movie scenes are actually composed of handcrafted paintings. These picturesque renderings are known as matte paintings. The artists who make them are some of the most admired individuals in the effects world. Creating a matte shot involves painting a set or location which would be too expensive or even impossible to photograph live. One of the finest matte painters working today is Sid Dutton. He and his partner Bill Taylor run Illusion Arts, an effects studio in Los Angeles. This studio has created spectacular vistas for Cape Fear, The Neverending Story 2, and this incredible long distance pullback for the musical Newsies. There's two factors for determining how much detail we put into a painting. One is how much the painting actually needs it. I mean, sometimes wherever the attention of the composition is focused is where we put the most detail, where the actor might be walking. The second, of course, is time. If we don't have much time, we don't have much time. We have to go for the broader strokes and more impact. When you're in the front row of a, of a theater and looking at the screen, you aren't really seeing a tremendous amount of detail. You're seeing blobs of color. So if you can emulate that by putting blobs of color on the right, right manner, then it will have a, a chance of looking more convincing. I've always called it photo-impressionism. You're trying to give the impression of reality without all the detail you actually see. Knowing just how much detail to include is a skill that few aspiring matte artists can master. So when Dutton discovered a gifted 23-year-old painter, he immediately put him to work. What impressed me about Robert Stromberg was that he was self-taught and had really d developed to a great extent by himself. There's two types of matte paintings, essentially. There's people who draw things out and fill them in, and there's paint pushers. That's what Robert does, is he pushes paint and gets an effect by mushing paint around and, and seeing something in it. I saw a cable special on matte paintings when I was about 12, and I became interested and went out and bought a camera started doing glass shots out in the middle of a field somewhere. It just kind of escalated, and uh, by the time I was just graduating high school, I uh, was offered my first shot for an actual film. Today, Robert is starting work on a painting for the big screen version of Dennis the Menace. It's far away enough where you can get away. As the painting progresses, Stromberg must rely on his color sense and keen eye for detail. It's hard for me to enjoy uh, what's out in the country. Uh, if I'm taking a drive, I spend more time figuring out how it was created and why the colors 
uh, look the way they do, why the light's hitting it a certain way. You feel that you want to understand how it works, and uh, eventually you do. And coming in here, it's very easy, uh, because it's, it's already painted in my head. I already see it finished. It's just a matter of actually going through the process. Once the painting is completed, it is turned over to cinematographer Bill Taylor for filming. This is where the matte painting is brought to life. By carefully adding elements such as miniature trees and a moving train, Taylor will add depth to this two-dimensional painting. A computer-controlled camera allows Bill to give precise movement to the shot. The hardest thing in a shot that's pure painting or entirely artificial is just making it look real. You have to be careful in a shot like this. Uh, you have to do a camera move that looks realistic, that looks like a kind of move that could actually be done in a movie. After the painting is complete and photographed, it is edited into the film. If the matte painters have done their work well, movie audiences will never detect that the scene wasn't shot on location. Elements like a miniature train help audiences accept a two-dimensional painting as reality. This is one of the many tricks of the trade employed by Matt Studios. Here at Matt World in Novato, California, a team of experts are shooting a rain element which will be added to a painting to simulate a dark, stormy night. What appears to be rain is actually baking soda fed through a special sieve. A computer controls the rotation of the sieve, ensuring a consistent rain-like pattern. Cameraman Wade Childress shoots the rain element against a black background. Later, the black will be replaced optically with a shot of a matte painting. Another time-honored matte technique involves letting light pass through holes in the painting to simulate city lights. Matte artist Michael Pangrazio is lighting up the city of Salem in this painting for Disney's Hocus Pocus. We're putting dots of light in the city and uh, it's, it's done by scratching through the front layer of the paint because this is painted on a pane of glass and then it's backlit with an additional light and it pushes the exposure higher than white paint can give you by lighting what's behind it brighter. Because they utilize timeless art tools and techniques, matte shots have a long and illustrious history in motion pictures. Their use dates back to the silent era and such films as The Thief of Baghdad. Matt World co-owner Craig Barron is a foremost historian on matte painting. It's recognized among the people that I know that uh, a gentleman named Norman O'Don is probably one of the first, if not the first, uh, sort of father of matte paintings. And he used matte shots uh, around the turn of the century. The first examples of this were uh, what's called a glass shot. There's a camera set up with a uh, piece of glass that the camera is photographing through. And the matte artist actually paints on that piece of glass out on location. Now the disadvantages to that are that the crew has to wait until the matte artist is finished doing that painting. In 1911, Dawn developed an easier process called the latent image technique. News of this method spread across the Atlantic, where an English matte artist, Percy Pop Day, began to use it in 1914. So now the uh, glass is still out on location. You're photographing through the glass. But instead of a matte painting being there, it's just a black silhouette. So that when the camera photographs through that piece of glass, the exposure is held back. The information is then recorded later with the matte painting back at the studio. In his 33-year career, Pop Day used the latent image process to create hundreds of matte shots in more than 45 films. His credits include the 1940 remake of The Thief of Baghdad, 60 Glorious Years, and The Mikado, for which Day created Japanese temples on a London soundstage. Once matte artists were able to paint in a studio instead of on location, the quality of the paintings improved immensely. Damn you, lose your turn in the flesh! 
In 1939, Gone with the Wind required more than 100 flawless matte paintings. A small army of painters, overseen by photographic effects supervisor Jack Cosgrove, was charged with bringing the Old South back to life. Nearly all of these matte paintings employed the latent image technique. This spectacular Atlanta cityscape was created by filming a dirt road on the MGM backlot in Culver City, California and then adding the painting later in the special effects Stop. studio. Stop! The crew of the Yank is coming! I'm afraid so, ma'am. The army's pulling out. Here's a film that is supposed to be taking place in the Civil War South. It was photographed, for the most part, in Culver City. There are hundreds of map paintings in that movie. Uh, Civil War battlefields, Terra, all these things were created with map paintings. With matte painting firmly established as an important visual effects medium, new masters of the craft began to emerge. Walt Disney admired the work Percy Day's stepson, Peter Ellenshaw, had done on Treasure Island. In 1948, Walt brought the Englishman to Hollywood to work full-time for Disney Studios. He would always be telling people here that he had a young artist in uh, England who'd worked on Treasure Island, and he made it so you didn't have to go to some island. He could make it look as though it's in, in the island by painting these things. Ellen Shaw became a valued member of the Disney team. In 1960, his stylized matte paintings of England won him an Academy Award for Mary Poppins. Well, Mary Poppins was an exciting film, mainly because Walt Disney was involved from the very beginning. You didn't have to make it so real that it didn't look fanciful. It's a wonderful film. Everybody still loves it, don't they? While he was at Disney, Ellen Shaw began to work on his own paintings on the side. In 1987, he retired from the film business to pursue fine art. Peter occasionally emerges from retirement to help out his son Harrison, who heads up Disney's Buena Vista visual effects. The two painted side by side on the hit film Dick Tracy. Meanwhile, one of Ellen Shaw's former associates, Albert Whitlock, had also become recognized as a top matte artist. Whitlock's outstanding career at Universal Studios was highlighted by two Academy Awards and by his work with one of the world's greatest directors. Hitchcock, of course, was the outstanding director in my life. I had a special relationship with him. Um, now, of course, he was, he was a master, unquestionably, and uh, as far as match shots were concerned, and anything else for that matter, he always was able to tell you what he wanted, but why he wanted it. Alfred Hitchcock asked for this painting from the birds to give a bird's eye view of the chaos created by the film's airborne antagonists. To create the shot, Whitlock combined a live action street scene with this painting. The addition of live birds resulted in one of the film's most memorable images. One of his favorite expressions was, if you want to make a movie, you get four good scenes that the audience will remember later on. So then you just string it together with a bit of story. Whitlock continued to paint spectacular shots for Universal. In 1974, he was honored with an Academy Award for his paintings, which, combined with miniatures, portrayed the devastated Los Angeles in Earthquake. Albert Whitlock has consistently added a degree of realism to matte painting and special effects in general that wasn't there before he arrived on the scene. His work is, is truly flawless and uh, wonderful to watch. Albert Whitlock continued painting until his retirement in 1988. By that time, one of his former assistants, Sid Dutton, had firmly established himself as a top matte artist. Okay, move the card camera right. Sid Dutton showed promise in the beginning. I mean, I could make jokes about having to whip him into shape, but I really didn't have to. I mean, of course, I owe everything to Al Whitlock. I mean, he taught me everything that I know about my craft. I, I did have a painting background, but I mean, it, it didn't do me any good for this particular craft. At Paramount Studios in Hollywood, Albert Whitlock protégés Sid Dutton and Bill Taylor are working to create a matte shot for the comedy sequel, Adam's Family Values. Illusion Art's task is to turn a small section of exterior wall into a much larger view of the Adam's ghoulish mansion. 
Do you want me to look? Sid works with effects supervisor Alan Monroe to create a low angle shot of the Adams house from which the family nanny escapes on a line made of sheets. What we're really doing more than anything else is extending the set. Even though matte paintings cost a certain amount of money, it's still cheaper than trying to build that entire set. So that's our primary function is to extend the set. To achieve this effect, the filmmakers will shoot the live action now with a black mat masking the area that will contain the painting. The artwork will be done later at Illusion Art Studio. The nanny, played by stunt woman Joni Avery, works closely with the crew to verify the angle of the shot. Secure the camera, lock it off, and uh, take a look. Once the angle is agreed upon, the camera is secured so it can't move between takes. Each take must be identical if the mat is to be perfectly blended into the live action footage. The crew then creates the mat that will hold back the exposure for the area of the film in which the painting will appear. <laughs> Depending on where the mat is placed relative to the camera, the mat line can either be soft or out of focus, or it can be very hard and sharp. To make it hard or sharp, the mat has to be far enough away from the camera that it's in focus along with the other elements of the scene. Obviously, to make it out of focus, you just have to move the mat closer, and you can make it out of focus to any degree that you wish. You'd use a hard mat if you wanted to go around a sharp edge, like the edge of a building. A black hood is then draped over the camera so that no light can pass between the camera and the mat. This ensures that the area covered by the mat remains unexposed. The first several takes are ruined by either the nanny or the sheik passing over the edge of the mat line. That's a cut. Her, uh, her fanny went into the uh, mat line. If any part of her body goes under the mat, that part of her body would disappear. Right, right there, you came out a little bit too far. And the rest of the climb was perfect. Okay. The rest of the climb was perfect. Okay. You also sort of have to hug the face of the, uh, the, the tower mm -hmm. as you start to come down. Okay. As you come down more, you'll have more latitude to swing out. Okay. Eventually, everyone is in sync and some good takes are photographed. That's a cut. Reload. We got a good one. Did you? But one good take is not enough. Since the latent image technique involves imprinting the painting directly on the live action shot, sometimes several takes can be ruined before the shot is perfect. The good takes are broken down into separate rolls and they're stored in the freezer. When the painting is finished, we take the good take out of the freezer, thread it up into the camera, and expose the painting onto the good take into that unexposed area that was left reserved, so to speak, by the mat. When the filming is complete, Robert Stromberg is assigned the painting duties. Mat camera operator Mark Sawicki projects a single frame of the film onto a blank canvas, allowing Robert to sketch in the mat lines in pencil. That's it. That's all I need. The painting process involves adding the sky and the upper portion of the house up to the marked matte edges. It's still a little bit fuzzy. It's still a little fuzzy. I didn't have to bring. Yeah. What I think it is, it's on, on both sides. It should be a little bit thicker, this board. Yeah, I think so too. This one. When the painting is complete, Stromberg brings it to Sawicki to complete the shot. This is the exact same film that was shot on location. So this has only the live action element. This has the nanny on it, and it has not been exposed. To add motion to the painting, Sawicki will expose the film in such a way that the clouds appear to move across the screen. What this mat's going to do is just reveal that area of the painting where the sky is. 
He'll do this by creating a split, which is accomplished by exposing different portions of the painting in separate passes. There's a mat in front of the lens that leaves only the top part of the painting exposed. If that painting is moved slowly as it's photographed, only in that top section, it will appear on the screen as though the clouds at the top of the frame are moving from one side to the other. Matte technician Lynn Ledgerwood turns a small hand crank to move the painting. The process is precisely timed so that the clouds move as the nanny descends. As the final shot shows, the moving clouds are a crucial element in blending the painting with the live action shot. The overall effect makes the Adams house a spooky haunt from which a nanny would want to escape. While matte artists contribute to some of film's most memorable scenes, they will never achieve the prominence they deserve for a very simple reason. They're trying very hard to be undetected, and the better they are at being und undetected, then nobody will know about them. I think the, the beauty of uh, matte work and the reason why it's lived right through into this very sophisticated era is because, it's, as uh, mathematicians would say, it's a wonderful equation piece of glass, some paint, and some film. You know, and it's just common sense putting it together. I mean, really, it is.